Well, greetings once again to all my Math 103 students. We have, as of the last class, finished going over any new material which you might face on the final exam. Today, we are going to concentrate on our first review class to help you get ready for the final exam, okay? So today, we are going to go over the sheets that I ask you to look at Okay, exam review one, the four pages that go with that. And I want you to make sure you get those out and that you have those in your possession right now. So as we go over this material today, you will be ready to rock and roll and we'll be able to go over this material with us together. Now, the exam review one and two, our uh, exam review one, which is for, two pages, front, back, both pages. Actually, it's four sheets for you, all right? Is the first of a series of sheets you definitely want to be aware of and to have studied to prepare for the final exam. So as we uh, continue to get ready for the exam, make sure you've sent me any quizzes or even the big virus quiz if you've not done so already so that we can get your scores all up to date so that we know you're doing fine and that you're ready to rocket through this final and score well on this course. So without any further waste of time, we are going to begin this review session, okay? So get exam review one out, all right, at this time, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the screen with you, okay? I have lost you for a second, but not for long. Uh, I have to go back to uh, Zoom here for a minute and get us so that we are in the meeting together. And now I will share the screen with this particular file. And I'll hit share here and we're ready to rock and roll. So here we go. Okay. Well, on the exam, I'm going to give you a problem just like this one. This one's pretty easy. However, as we get to the end of the review next Tuesday, all right, uh, or excuse me, next Thursday, I will show you a much harder table problem, which you will be probably be seeing something of that difficulty level on the final. So let's take a look. It says, the table below shows a series of, of numbers. Determine what, all right, determine what the next set of values should be for x, y, and z. Well, this table's pretty simple, right? You can see to get every single y, all we have to do is double x. So let's write that down. We know that y is equal to 2x each time. And what do we have to do to y each time to get z, does it appear? Well, I think you can tell just by looking at the table, we have to add three to it. Or in other words, we could say that z is equal to y plus 3 here in each case, all right? Or we could also say it this way, z is equal to 2x plus 3 each time, okay? So if that be the case, by the way, what would the next number be after 9 in the x column? Well, it obviously looks like it would be 10, right? So if it would be 10, what would y have to be? Well, y would have to be twice that or 20. And what would the last number have to be? Well, it would have to be three more than 20 or 23. So to answer the questions on this particular table in the next part, it says, using the letters x, y, and z, write a formula you could use to determine the value of z given a particular x. Well, we already wrote that formula up above, right? It was simply that z is equal to what? It is equal to two times x increased by three, all right? So that would definitely say how you would get the value of z each time. And the only other thing you would have to indicate is that to get the next x in the table, all you'd have to do is add one. 
So this table was fairly simple, but I wanted to give you a simple one to start out with because as you're going to see, as we get to the harder one, which you will see a week from today, a week from Thursday, you'll get an idea that this is going to be a little bit more difficult problem. All right, let's go on. What was the next question on the sheet? Well, the next question on the sheet was to verify that this set of numbers here is a Pythagorean triple. Well, if this set of numbers is a Pythagorean triple, it means what? The numbers have to fit the rule of Pythagoras, right? All right, so let's go through that, okay? Let's put them in and see if it works. By the way, the rule of Pythagoras says a squared plus b squared has to equal c squared. Now, hopefully you have your phone or your calculator handy so we can do this work and practice it, all right, in case you haven't done this already. So what will c be in this particular formula? Well, it's got to be the longest piece, right? Or 137, right? So if I square 137, will I get, well, I can let A or B be either of the other two. Usually I let A be the smaller one. So if I square 88 and I add to it the square of 137, do I get this, I'm sorry, not 107, not 137. Sorry about that. All right, I don't want that in there. What do I want in there? 105, right? So let's put that in there. 105, all right, squared. Will that give me 137 squared? Well, if I take my calculator and I take 88 and I square it, I get 77.44. If I square 105, I obtain, whoop, let me start again, 105x squared is 10, uh, excuse me, 110.25. Is this going to give me the same thing as 137 squared? So next I take 137 and I square it. And when I do, I get 18,769. All right, if I take my calculator and I add 77,44 plus 110,25, what do I get? 18,769. 18,769 is definitely equal to 18769. I've checked it out. I can say QED, right? Quite enough has been done on this problem to show that it is indeed a Pythagorean triple. So I have verified it. Okay, not so bad. Well, let's go to our next page. Okay. Now, as you are going to see, this problem. It goes back to the Fibonacci's. And what it does is it asks us to look for a pattern. And you recall earlier in the course, I said I would not on the first quiz ask you to establish a formula or a pattern that was developed with these Fibonacci numbers. However, it's time for the final. And of course, on the final, I am going to ask you to come up with a formula. So given this list of Fibonacci numbers above, Evaluate the following formula, formula for n equals 4, 5, 6, and 7. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'll move this down. I'll do it for n equals 4 up here first. Okay, so what am I going to do? I am going to take f sub 4. I'm going to put the 4 in for n. So that means it will be f5, right? I will square that. Okay, Fn, since n is 4, will be F4, all right? And when I square that, what do I obtain? Well, i got to go back up here. F5 is 5, so I'm going to square 5. F4 
is the Fibonacci number three. I'm going to square three. I'm going to add them together after I square them to see what I obtain. Well, 25 plus nine equals 34. All right. Well, notice I got another Fibonacci number. Well, let's go on. Let's do this. 4n equals 5. Okay, so then my formula will read what? It will read f sub 6 squared. Now, if you don't know where I'm getting the 6 from, remember, the formula says f sub n plus 1. So that's where I'm getting the 6 from. I'm adding 5 and 1 together to get 6. So I'm going to square f sub 6. I'm going to add to it the square of f sub n, which is f5. Well, of course, you know what that is. It's 5 squared or 25, right? So what am I going to get here? Well, f6. Well, I got to go back to my Fibonacci's. My f6 is 8. All right. So I'm going to take 8 and square it. And of course, 8 squared is 64. If I add 64 and 25 together, I get 89. Hey, that's another Fibonacci number, right? Well, let's keep going. We were asked to do this for n is 4, 5, 6, and 7, right? So let's do it down here for n equals 6. Well, that means that I'm going to get the seventh Fibonacci number, right? Which is 13. So I'm going to square f sub 7, which will be 13 squared. I'm going to add to it f sub 6 squared. Of course, f sub 6 is an 8. Well, let's see. 169 plus 64. Well, let's see. That looks like 223, right? And I believe that's another Fibonacci number, right? Well, I think you see a pattern is growing here. And what we're going to do is continue to do this, all right, uh, to get n equals 7 over here. So I'm going to do f sub, not 7 here, but f8. I'm going to square it. Add to it the square of f7 and see what I obtain. Well, let's see. Uh, f8, again, if I go back up to my table, f8 is 21. So if I square 21 and I add to it the square of 13, well, we already squared 13 a moment ago, it was 69. Just to be safe, I'm going to square 21 over here. All right, 21 squared is 441. And if I add 441 and 169 together, I believe I get 9, 10. 6 and 4, 10 is 1 is 11. 4, 5, I believe I get 6, 10. All right, now it's time to see if we can discover what pattern has occurred here. Oh, wait a minute. We got Fibonacci numbers each time, didn't we? 34 is a Fibonacci number. We found that 89 is a Fibonacci number. We know that. So what Fibonacci numbers did we get? Well, we got 34, which is F sub 9. I'm going to put that down here. That's the same as F sub 9. We got 89 for our second answer, and that was F sub 11, right? And for our next answer, we have obtained, it looks like 233, right? And of course, if we look at 233 up here, that's 13, right? So uh, that's Fibonacci number 13, that is. Okay, so that's F13. And I don't think it's any surprise to you that 610 is F sub 15. Now, if we were to write all this down, okay, for example, let's write the last one down. Notice, 
f sub 8 squared plus f sub 7 squared gave us f sub 15. If we do it for n equals 6 over here, f sub 7 squared plus f sub 6 squared gave us f sub 13. Can we see a pattern here? I think we can. You can add the subscripts together. Can you see that? If I add 7 and 6 here, I get 13. If I add 8 and 7 here, I get 15. So now, if I take my formula, okay, if I take my formula, f sub n plus 1, that squared, plus f sub n, that squared, what appears is going to happen? Well, we just said it. If you add the subscripts together, you have the subscript of the answer we obtained. So it should be what? Well, it'd be f sub n plus n plus 1. I just add the subscripts together, right? Well, what is n plus n in algebra? It's 2n, right? So this is the same thing as f sub 2n plus 1. So right here is one answer that's acceptable to this problem. You have explained using a general formula what happens to these Fibonacci numbers in these sequences, okay? Now, what if you couldn't come up with that? What if you just wrote down, add the subscripts together each time, and you get the subscript of the answer? Would I count that right? Yes, I would. That would be just fine, okay? So, how's that looking? Not bad, right? Okay? So, you get the idea. So on the exam, I'm going to ask you to either write out a formula similar to this one, or I'm going to ask you to explain it in your own words. By the way, how do you get from one Fibonacci number, take the one previous to that, how do you get to the one after the one I was just talking about? For example, if I'm at the 10th Fibonacci number, how do I get to the 11th Fibonacci number? All I have to do is add to it the ninth Fibonacci number, right? Remember that? All right, so down here in the next question, you're asked, what's the actual number that is F sub 18? Well, if we go up to our table here, if I go up to our table, we are at F 15, right? I want to know what F 18 is. Well, if I add F 14 and add F 15 to it, I should get F16, shouldn't I? And then if I went and added F16, I'm sorry, F15 to F16, I should be able to obtain F17, right? And then if I took F16 and added to it F17, I should have the value of F18, right? Okay, so all I have to do is take 14 and 15, add them together. So that's 377 plus 610. And I take that answer. Well, let's get that. 377 plus 610. 377 plus 610 is how much? 987. Now, if I take 610 and add to it 987, right, I should have F sub 17. So I'll take 987 plus 610, and I get 1597. And of course, now, if I take F, which is number 16, which was 987, and add to it, 1597, I should be able to come up with F18. So I simply add those two together. And when I do, I get 2584. So what I wrote here 
<coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I would have to do down below, down here, to get the actual value of x sub 18. Hopefully that was fairly simple for you. I am going to give you some type of relationship like this on the final exam, and I'm going to ask you to figure out, okay, the formula like we did right here in this step. Also, I may ask you to get an actual value of a Fibonacci number that isn't in the table I provide for you. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. Okay, the next question says, <clears throat> how many sheets of paper thick is a large sheet of paper folded? Okay, I've got my image in the way here, so I can't, I cannot see uh, what I want here. Let me open this back up. Let me pull this down here. Okay. How many sheets of paper thick is a large sheet of paper folded in half 18 times? Now, if you recall from our study of exponential growth, okay, each time you fold a sheet of paper, it doubles in thickness. All right? So it's always a power of what? It's a power of two. Each of the folds, okay, represents doubling the thickness, right? So what do I have to obtain here to get this answer? Well, if you recall, all I have to do is take two and take it to the what? The 18th power. And if you recall on your calculator, it's the y to the x key, excuse me, it's the caret key on your calculator and the one I'm using right now, it's the y to the x key. But all you have to do is take two and take it to the power of 18 hitting the carrot key, and you obtain 262,144 sheets thick would be if you were able to fold a sheet of paper 18 times. That would be the thickness of sheets that you would have. You think that's going to be on the final? Oh, yeah. You know it is. All right. Let's go on. Determine the prime factorization, right as a product of primes, 4301. Now, you'll notice that I did not, on this review sheet, put a list of prime numbers. I'm going to tell you right now, the prime factorization problem I'm going to give you on the final exam is so simple, you won't need a chart of primes. This one's a little harder. Well, let's see. We want to see what primes will go into 4301. So what we usually do, if you recall, is write the number down low or divided by. Well, I look at it and I say to myself, is that number divisible by two? Well, does it end in zero, two, four, six, or eight? No. So it's not divisible by two. So the prime two will not go into it. How about the prime three? Well, let's see, 4301, four and three is seven, and one adds up to eight. Well, eight's not divisible by three, so 4301 is not divisible by three. So two and three do not go in. Does it end 4301 in five or zero? No, it does not. Therefore, 4301 is not divisible by five. So let's try the primes after that, okay? So what's the next prime after five? Well, you know it's seven. So take 4301 and see if it divides by seven evenly. 4301 divided by seven equals, oh, we get junk, comes out 614.42 and a bunch of other stuff. So seven's no good. So I try my next prime, which would be what? 11. So I take 4301 and I divide it by 11. All right. And when I do, I get, oh, 391. Now, that's interesting. Now, we're all done with this problem that 391 is a prime. But I have a feeling it's not. 
Okay, now what we're going to have to do is realize that I'm going to have to divide by another prime here. Listen, if 2, 3, 5, or 7 would have gone in to 391, probably, if it would have gone into 4301 is what I'm saying. So we don't want to start with 2, 3, 5, or 7 over again. We might as well start right at 11 where we left off. So let's try that. So let's take 391 and let's divide it by 11. Oh, junk. So 11 doesn't work. What's my next prime? 13. Well, let's try that. 391 divided by 13 is junk. Well, 30.076 keeps on going. 13 is no good. Not 15 is the next prime, but our next prime is what? 17, right? So I will take 391, 391, and divide it by 17. And lo and behold, it goes in evenly. So 17 goes into this, and it goes 23 times. Well, 23 is a prime number. You know that. It's odd. There's no other number that it will divide into 23 except itself or 1. Okay, therefore, the prime factorization of 4301 is simply what? 11 times 17 times 23. So I will give you a problem of about that hardness, if you will, on the final exam for you to determine the prime factorization of a number. Notice I'm not going to ask you to test to see if the numbers are prime or composite first. All I'm going to do is say, here's a number, get its prime factorization for me. Okay? So that's it on that. Let's move on. Okay. Maybe I skipped one here. Let's see. Did I skip a problem? I did. Right. 49.787878 dot 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 as a fraction. Now, you know this is a repeating decimal. It's a rational number, right, if it's a repeating decimal. So you know it came from a fraction. And if you recall, there's this crazy method I called the Kelly's Cheater Method, right? So the whole number is going to go out here, 49 point, all right? But I don't even want the point, right, because I want a fraction. So why don't I take that point out of there, okay? So now what am I going to do? I'm going to take the repeating decimal part, 7, 8, 7, 8, 7, 8. Since it repeats in groups of 2, how many 9s do I put the 78 over? You're right. It's 2. So it'll simply be 78 over 99. And that, of course, is the correct answer. You don't even have to reduce the fraction, even though it probably is reducible, okay, 3 will go into 78, 3 will go into 99, but I don't care if you reduce it, just get me the fraction it came from. How else can you double check yourself? Just divide 78 by 99. See if you get 0 0.78787878, 78, 78, 78, 78, 78. and if you do, you're all set, right? State the defining properties of a regular or a platonic solid. There are two pieces to this that you have to know. What's one of the pieces? Okay. All right. All the faces are identical. Better word for that is congruent. Regular polygons, all the faces are identical, congruent, regular polygons. They're all pentagons, or they're all triangles, equilateral triangles, or regular pentagons. Uh, as you know, they can, they can only be triangles, or pentagons, or squares, be a regular polyhedron, okay? 
we can't have any others, okay, which we'll discuss later. So that's one thing we have to know. What's the other thing we have to know that is a defining property of platonic solids or regular polyhedrons? The last thing is what? Emitting from each vertex is the same number of faces and what? Edges. In order to be a regular polyhedron or a platonic solid, these two properties have to be met. Okay? Any question on that? Let's hope not. Let's roll on. Okay. All right. Take a look at this figure. Given this polyhedron, notice it's not a regular polyhedron, show that the Euler characteristic is satisfied. In other words, V minus E plus F gives me two. Okay. Now notice the height is in here for this figure. The height is not an edge. The height is the perpendicular distance from the base to the apex of the pyramid, but we don't care about that. We want to just use edges, faces, and vertices. Okay? Well, let's go. You ready? So let's start with the number of uh, vertices. So let's go V equals, I'll do it in blue. Simplest way to do it is what? Label them. There's one up there, two, three, four, five vertices. Okay, how many edges do we have? Well, let's see. I'll change colors and I'll go to red. And I will put a number right on each edge. One, two, three, four edges go up to the top, right? And then there are four edges around the bottom of the figure, right? So that's five, six, seven, and eight. So it appears that there are eight edges. Now, how many faces do I have? All right, for the number of faces, I'll do it in green. There is the base, which is face number one. There is the back face, which is face number two, coming around the figure from behind. This face would be the third face, the one that's to the right. The one that's kind of in the front mostly would be the fourth face. And the one around to the left would be the fifth face. So it appears to be five faces. So is the formula satisfied? All right, if we go back into it again, I change back to, well, let's go to black ink. So if V, excuse me, let me start again. V minus E plus F, all right? So we're going to do V minus E plus F. Do we indeed get two? So the vertices happen to be five, the edges happen to be eight, the faces happen to be five. Do we indeed get two? Five minus eight is negative three. Negative three plus five does give me two. All right, QED, we have satisfied it. No problem, okay? Will there be a problem like that on the final exam? Absolutely, you can count on it. All right. Let's go down here. Write 2357 as the sum of non-consecutive, non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers. Okay, well, to in order to perform this, what am I got to do? Well, I have to find the biggest Fibonacci number to 2357. That's smaller, if you recall. So I write down 23. 57 
and I write it as the <clears throat> sum of the closest Fibonacci number to it that is smaller, 1597, plus whatever the difference is of those two. So if I take 2357 and subtract 1597, what I do, I get um, 760. Now I am finished with this problem if 760 is a Fibonacci number. Well, of course it isn't, right? So I rewrite the 1597. I find the closest Fibonacci number to 760, okay? And what will that be? Well, let's see. Looks like 610, right? So I'm going to write 610 in the place of 760 plus the difference between 610 and 760, which I believe is 150. Well, I'm done with the problem if 150 is a Fibonacci number. Unfortunately, it is not. So I keep going. 1597 plus 610 plus what's the closest Fibonacci number to 150 that is smaller? Well, it's 144. Now, how much am I shy of 150? It would be 6, right? 6 is not a Fibonacci number, so I have to keep going. 1597 plus 610 plus 144. What's the closest fib to 6? That's smaller. Well, that would be 5, right? And how much am I missing 6 by? Just 1. And 1 is a Fibonacci number. So you'll notice here is this number, 2357, written as the sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Notice 1 here, uh, 5, uh, 144, wait a minute, 1, 5, 144, right? And um, 610 and 1597. They are not next to each other, right? So we have solved the problem. Any question on that? Hopefully you got that down. There'll be one of those on the final. Okay, let's take a look at the next problem. Uh, give an example of a rational number between 5.3865 and 5.3866. Well, to do that, remember, all we have to do is get a number, first of all, between them. So if I add together, all right, 5.3865, and add to it 5.3866, and then divide them by two to get the average of them, I should have a number between them. Well, if you took the time to do that on your calculator, you would get 5.38655. If I add one zero to each of these, you can see 55 is between 50 and 60. Now, let me ask you a question. Am I finished with this problem? Is the number I just obtained between those other two? It is. Is it rational? It is. Therefore, we're finished. No problem. Okay. Now, let's tackle the next problem. Okay. Well, you know, they're the same two numbers I started with in problem J, right? So if I add the two numbers together and divide them by two, you know I'm going to attain, obtain 5.38655. But this is definitely not an irrational number. So how do I make it irrational? Well, here's one way. You can cheat. And you can do this. If you put an arrow after it, what's that tell me, the test grader? You realize that the numbers are all over the place by drawing that arrow. 
okay? So that's one way you can do that, all right? Okay, now let me take that arrow off of there. What's another way I could do it, okay? Another way I could do this would be to just put numbers all over the place myself, like two, seven, one, three, eight, six, two, nine, seven, two, five, one, three, dot, dot, dot. And since those numbers are all over the place, that pretty much tells me there's not going to be a pattern there, right? So therefore, that's an irrational number. Well, what's my favorite way for you to do this? My favorite way for you to do this would be this. Put a pattern on there, an irrational pattern on that number. And to do that, all I simply have to do is this. Pick up any numbers you want two, three, and make a pattern out of it. Two, three, three, two, three threes, two, four threes, two, five threes, dot, dot, dot. Don't forget your three dots. You have to have the three dots to show that the pattern continues to infinity. Therefore, you know this number is definitely irrational. And the last problem on this sheet for the first review sheet we had, exam review one, is to state why we know that this number cannot be written as a fraction. Well, if you look at the number, you can see it has a pattern, right? See one seven, two sevens, three sevens, four sevens, five sevens, okay? Now, what's that telling you? This is gonna go on to infinity. The next time you're gonna have more sevens, like instead of uh, five of them, you're gonna have six of them and then a five, seven of them and then a five. So this is definitely an irrational number. And you know irrational numbers cannot be written or come from fractions. You cannot divide any fraction, top divided by bottom, and obtain an irrational number. They will always either repeat or terminate. So your answer to this question is simply, the number is irrational, it cannot be written as a fraction. Well, we finished the first exam review sheet, exam review one, and now in the next video, we are going to tackle some extra problems that I have put together for you to look at today. So here we go. Now go to the film called 30, April 30th, number two.